So um, uh, with that, let me introduce Lilia. She's been the Executive Director of Children's Law Center of Minnesota since what, 2013, I think, around there. And um, she, uh, the Children's Law Center provides uh, direct legal representation of foster children starting at age 10, up to 21 when they age out. Uh, it's a court appointed uh, uh, program. So they represent children appointed by the courts and youth in Ramsey and Hennepin counties. So they recruit and train and supervise pro bono attorneys, over 300 of them to provide advocacy for abuse and neglected children and youth in Minnesota. Um, in addition to the direct legal representation, CLC is also involved in systemic and best practices changes that affect the lives of all of Minnesota's foster children. Uh, Lily is a graduate of William Mitchell College of Law and has been in her current role since 2013. And prior to that, she managed business operations at Thomson Reuters. So I will give that much of a bio and introduction. You probably want to talk a lot more, Lily, about Children's Law Center, but thank you so much for being here and we appreciate it and just take it away. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? Great. All right. So thank you, Rich. I am Lilia. Um, I run Children's Law Center of Minnesota, one of the most amazing organizations out there um, that actually has the privilege of working with volunteer attorneys to do the work that we do. And so the, the main purpose of um, our, our service to children in foster care is really to be their voice, um, to be their um, advocate and to be the person that shows up for the kids and also um, sort of helps translate everything that happens in the courtroom and behind the doors or in between the courtroom court hearings. I have, let me see if I can share this with you, kind of want, I have some slides that I can share with you that help me facilitate the discussion. Can you see it? Okay, yes. I didn't hear a yes, but I, I could uh, read the lips. Um, so not probably so much of a surprise here for you in terms of what we're dealing with in the state of Minnesota. We have roughly six, uh, 16,000 children um, who come into foster care every year in Minnesota and over 70% of those children are children of color. Pretty much all of them uh, or most of them suffer from PTSD three to four times that of veterans coming back from Iraq. We're talking about trauma, repeated abuse and neglect, uh, the trauma of being removed from home, the trauma of being placed into a stranger's home and not knowing what's tomorrow, not knowing if they'll see their families, if they'll see their siblings. So of all the, of all the children that are removed from home, about 60% of them will be reunified. Unfortunately, of the 60% that will be reunified, somewhere up to 30% will re-enter. Minnesota's not doing very well on re-entry. Re-entry could be um, caused by parents relapsing. Uh, Re-entry could be caused by a failed adoption or failed reunification for whatever reason, which is why we believe that having a voice, um, a child's voice in the courtroom is very important. And, and one of the typical examples is while the judge has a role to determine what is in the best interest of the child, if the judge doesn't hear from the child, him or herself, as to what they want, what outcome they're looking for, for example, an adoption. If the judge doesn't hear from the child and orders an adoption into a home that the child doesn't want to be in, you are pretty much looking at disruption. You're pretty much looking at um, re-entry. And so that's where we come in and we, in the courtroom, will inform the judge that, you know, we don't believe this is a good fit. Um, our client doesn't want to be adopted by this family because this is actually what's happening in that home. And one of the amazing benefits that we have as lawyers for children is that we're bound by attorney-client privilege in all of our communications with children. So anything that a child shares with us 
stays confidential until and unless the child gives us an expressed permission to share what we just learned from the child in the courtroom or with someone else. And because we have this attorney client privilege, children tend to open up more to us. Uh, they, you know, once they understand what this means, um, they tell us things that sometimes they don't tell the social worker or the guardian ad litem or their um, foster parents. So um, um, that's why this role is very important. So just kind of moving on. So of the 40% that uh, will not be reunified. Those are the ones that are probably living with relatives or in the foster care pending adoption. And unfortunately, many of them end up aging out of the system without being adopted. And as you all know, you know, children who come into foster care, especially older children who are traumatized, um, it, it is not as easy to find them an adoptive home. You know, there are challenges, not everybody's ready for it. And so um, we, see, we see a good number of youth who age out of the system without um, a family, unfortunately. Their statistics aren't great either, you know, just because they are in foster care, only about 46% of them will graduate from high school. And I will share this, that the clients that we represent and we track this every year, 75% of our clients graduate from high school, whereas nationwide, it's anywhere from 30 to 46%. I actually think 46 is very high. American Bar Association reports that it's only 36% that graduate from high school. Um, so having that attorney really, really makes a difference because we, a Children's Law Center, at least as an organization, um, has a holistic approach to the legal representation. So it's not just going in the courtroom and being the lawyer for the child in the placement or reunification um, issues. We also look at what else the child needs. If there are any education issues, you know, there is expulsion that's happening. If there are any immigration issues, are there health? We see kids who come into foster care who have never been to a dentist. Um, and so while that is the responsibility of calling social workers, our job is also to make sure that we shed a um, spotlight on those issues that a child has and that we address all of the issues that a child may have so that we can remove all of those obstacles in order for them to succeed in life. Um, same, 6% will get post-secondary degree, 16% will achieve sustainable employment, the key is sustainable. There are a lot of factors that come into play for a youth coming out of foster care to have an employment and keep it. Um, so um, roughly 4,000 homeless youth in Minnesota on any given night. And 60% of those youth have been in foster care system at one point or another. I wanna say though, the 4,000 4, homeless youth is uh, a generous number and generous probably is not the good word for it, but it actually kind of counts in um, not necessarily children who are known to the system, but also children who are couch hopping. They could be, you know, not wanting to go back home and they sleep with their neighbors or they sleep at their friend's parents' house or whatever, for whatever reason. One of those reasons are youth coming out uh, with their sexual identity. We see cases where um, right around 12, 13, 14, or maybe older, when youth begins to identify themselves as um, either a different gender um, or whatever conforming, and they, um, they speak up to their parents and then the parents don't accept them or make it even more miserable for them. So then we see youth kind of sort of either on the run or staying with a different family because of that. Um, a little bit of a process. I'll go really quick over this one because I believe that you may be familiar with the process, but basically those are kind of the steps of what happens uh, for the child to come in and what happens after a child comes into care. So obviously there's abuse and neglect. It has to be egregious and repeated in order for a child to be, I don't know why it's doing this, in, uh, in order for a child to be removed from home. Um, or, or uh, uh, reported. So we have mandated reporters in the state of Minnesota. We also have voluntary reporters, somebody who, who you know, a neighbor notices, you know, a two-year-old barefoot 
uh, with bruises outside um, that, that we reported. And our system actually provides for um, an anonymous reporting so that uh, we don't disclose who made the report. But then we also have mandated reporters, and those are your doctors, teachers, um, you know, folks that have to report if they see something. Then there is going to be an investigation or assessment into the matter, and then the decision will be made whether or not the child should be removed or not. Sometimes those two last two steps, or the last step before that is um, skipped if, let's say, there is a police raid on a house. Uh, and the cops notice that there is a child or their children, and then the social workers are dispatched, uh, and the children are removed prior to, to the formal decision or outcome of an investigation or assessment. And then we kind of um, deal with that later. In Minnesota, only police law enforcement can remove a child from home. The social worker can be present, uh, but doesn't have to be, but really only cops can remove a child from home. That's the law in Minnesota. Um, and once the child is removed, um, uh, he or she is placed in either an emergency shelter or a home if they can identify a relative family. Obviously, ideally, it would be a relative so that there's some comfort to the child uh, rather than being placed either with a stranger family or in a shelter. A petition, a child protection petition will be filed in court. And that petition basically outlines why the system uh, believes that the child should be removed or the county attorneys or social worker believes that the child should be removed from home and that it is not safe for the child to stay at home. Once that petition is filed, it is within, actually not once the petition is filed, within 72 hours of the child being removed from home, there must be an emergency protective care court hearing. And it's 72 business hours, meaning that if a child is removed on a Friday, you skip Saturday, Sunday, and then it's Monday, Tuesday, it has to be on a Tuesday. So that's actually kind of five days, which is a long time for a child to be in that limbo. Um, and at that hearing, the judge will make a determination on whether the child should have been removed, if we had enough, um, to, to say that uh, the, the removal was um, justified. And in some instances, the, the child will be returned home if we believe that the system uh, sort of overreached here. And in, in instances where the, the court says, yep, um, this is legitimate, this is justified, the child will then stay in care. And what, what's called is they will then be adjudicated as a CHIPS, which stands for child, in need of protection or serve and or services. And with that, the, the county will then, or the agency will develop a case plan um, for the parents to fix the problems that got the kids into the system in the first place. The parents have one year to fix the problem in order for them to get their kids back. And once that one year is up, um, they lose uh, parental rights of the child if they haven't been able to um, to fix the problems. And in the meantime, there will be court review hearings to address, uh, to, to check on the progress of the case plan, how the parents are doing, if they need anything else, as well as check on the child to make sure they have everything they need, that they are in the right placement, that we are also concurrently working on plan B if re reunification fails. So we're looking at maybe relative search, kinship search, adaptive resources with the goal of reunification, of course, because we do want to reunify all families when possible. And if that's not possible, then the parents' parental rights are terminated. The children are then placed in foster care, either pending adoption or, or a better outcome would be a transfer of custody to a relative because um, study shows that children do better in the family, even if it's extended family setting. Um, and those whose parents' parental rights, are, those children whose parents' parental rights are terminated then become state wards, ward, wards of the state or legal orphans or legacy youth, however you want to, uh, what terminology you want to use, but basically it means it's, it's the child is basically um, uh, the child of the, of the state. So Minnesota now becomes the parent, the state of Minnesota. Um, uh, what is child abuse? I mean, or neglect. It's it's um, probably very familiar to you, but statutorily, this is how child abuse is defined. It's physical abuse. It's what you think it is, right? It's injuries. It's harm. 
it has to be substantial injury or imminent harm, um, you know, could be um, something that is so egregious, but, but probably not accidental, which accidents happen, right? Uh, and so that's why we have the investigation and assessment into that to see, was it really abuse or was it just an accident? We have sex abuse cases. In sex abuse cases, if the predator or perpetrator is um, one of the parents or custodial parents or custodian, there will be no case plan on the, on the matter. There will be an immediate termination of parental rights. Um, the parents will not even be given a chance to fix the problem because it's so egregious. It'll go to trial right away. Uh, and Parents who lose their parental rights involuntarily in the state of Minnesota are presumed to be unfit for any subsequent children as well. So if they have a child later down the road, um, they will be presumed to be unfit and uh, the system pretty much at birth will remove the child uh, and look into termination of parental rights. Neglect, also what you think it is. It could be neglect of, um, you know, not feeding them, not dressing them, not keeping the uh, environment clean, um, also uh, not attending to their uh, medical and health needs, et cetera. And then mental injury. That one is the tough one. We don't see too many of these come into the system. They're very hard to prove. And it's very unfortunate because older kids, we see teenagers where parents are sort of being very manipulative and all sorts of things. There's no evidence of abuse and it kind of becomes one of those, like he said, she said, and we unfortunately don't see too many of those cases come into the system. If the case comes into the system, it's very likely going to be on the neglect. So majority of cases coming in are neglect. Um, players in the system who are uh, at the table in the courtroom, you will have the county social worker represented by the county attorney. You will have a guardian ad litem in Minnesota. Every child at all ages um, coming into the system is entitled to a guardian ad litem who represents what they believe is in the child's best interest. The parent's attorney, so parents are entitled to an attorney. If they can't afford one, they will be appointed one. Child's attorney, that's us. In Minnesota, a child who is 10 years of age or older is entitled to legal representation. And unlike guardian ad litems, we do not represent a child's best interest. We represent the child's expressed wishes which may or may not be in the child's best interest. And that's where it gets very interesting. If a child is uh, equa eligible, Indian Child Welfare Act, for those of you who are familiar, there will also be a tribal representative present in the courtroom and working the case. And of course we have the judge who then listens to everybody, looks at all of the information reports coming in and makes the decision on what is in the best interest of the child and orders um, either adoption, reunification, you know, obviously uh, presents at the trial um, and all of the other adjudications. Um, yeah, so here we are, expressed wishes, whole child holistic approach, as I've mentioned. Um, you know, we get copies of all of the pleadings and reports as well. Uh, we help investigate facts again, because we talk to children and we, we actually uh, do a lot of information gathering as well. Um, and we attend all of the proceedings, trials, uh, hearings. Um, we argue child's position in court. Again, remember whether or not this is in the best interest of the child, we still argue the child's position. And so we kind of have to remove ourselves from what I personally as a parent think about my client's wishes. I may disagree or disagree, but I am to stay neutral in this case, just as any lawyer with an adult in any other case, you represent the client. Um, and, and kind of with that comes everything else that a lawyer does. Um, but counseling is also a big part of what we do. And that comes, um, is very important when we're dealing in a situation where a child is asking for something that is either egregious for the child or is not in the best interest. So for example, um, we may have a situation where a client says, I don't care what my parents did. I want to go back home. I don't care that I was abused. I don't care. I, when I love my mom and dad, I want to go back home. 
And this is where we step in as lawyers and put our sort of counseling hat on. And we have the discussion with our client to say that, you know what? Yes, this is what I will argue on your behalf in the courtroom. However, the judge is not is likely not going to agree with this because, you know, we're still looking into um, you know, the, the, the situation that brought you into the system in the first place, that the county still doesn't believe that it's safe for you to go back home. Um, and, and while I argue your position in court and, and in the case the judge doesn't agree with you, with our position, what's your plan B? Can you help me identify another resource that you would like to stay with? Or can you help me understand what can the county do to expedite this reunification? You know, this is where we kind of try to prepare the client for the judge's ruling that is not going to be um, uh, going along with the client's expressed wishes. So quite a bit of counseling. Also, you know, when it comes to older youth, if they keep making decisions that are not, you know, very good for them, like, you know, they run or they kind of get themselves involved with the uh, criminal justice system. Again, we begin counseling and say, look, I'm doing my best to, to represent you and, and get you the best outcome, but I'm kind of going to need you to cooperate here. Like, how, how about those, you know, um, you're running away and can you stay put for a few more months until we find you a better placement or things like that. So it's very, very involved counseling. And, and as you can imagine, representing a child is actually much different than representing an adult. Kids are kids, and these kids are also traumatized. And also, um, you know, a child can be a child. I, <laughs> I've gone to court and I had to tell a judge once, um, Your Honor, my client would like your permission to ride his bicycle without a helmet. And the judge looked at me and said, Counsel, and I said, Your Honor, that's what my client wants. And he said, all right, you will tell your client that no, he cannot ride his bicycle without helmet. Uh, I don't agree with it. And I said, thank you, Honor, I'll, I'll pass that along. And, and um, on, on its face kind of, you know, sounds silly, but I will tell you, going back to that client and the client knowing that regardless of what it was, I stood up for them and I advocated for their position and I was the lawyer is so powerful. It truly empowers youth and it truly helps them understand that they do have a voice in the system and that they can have input. And then the judge will listen uh, and that I am that vehicle to bring their voice into the courtroom. Um, and sort of our organization, we're a staff of 11. We have four staff attorneys one paralegal, two legal assistants, one social worker, and the social worker works for CLC. They're different than the county's social worker. Our social worker works also under the umbrella of attorney-client privilege. So they, can, they are not mandated reporters, unlike all other social workers, and they are bound by attorney-client privilege, meaning that they cannot discuss anything that the child and uh, informed them of. And yet they do serve an amazing uh, purpose in our organization. And that, you know, for those of you who've met lawyers before, you know, we kind of are very black and white and we have our heads down and we read the statute and we interpret and we don't, we're not very good at seeing the softer side of things, or we're not very good at being observant and noticing things that a trained social worker will, would. So having a social worker go out there and meeting the client and pointing things out to us, for example, you know, we've had instances where the social worker said, you know, I think that there is more to the case than there is in the petition. You know, I think that we may want to look at maybe there's some sexual abuse going on there. You know, those are the observations that we're not trained to have and, and our social workers are. And then they come back to um, our attorneys and their report back so that we can look further into what's going on. Um, overall, our work is about 60% in Ramsey County because in Ramsey County, we represent both CHIPS and state wards. Again, remember CHIPS are kids who still have an option of going back home. State wards are the ones whose parents' parental rights are terminated and their parents no longer have any legal rights or obligations. Um, and in Hennepin County, we represent state wards only 
and about 40% of our caseload is in Hennepin County. And we represented about 740 children in 2021. Uh, and if you compare that to 2019, I think it was 930. So um, in cases in Minnesota are going down starting with the pandemic, but we're not seeing them bounce back yet. We're, we're curious about it too, uh, in terms of we thought that the numbers have gone down because children were at home during the pandemic and there weren't, there weren't enough eyes on the children to report them. So the mandated reporters, you know, the teachers, the doctors were not seeing those kids uh, to report those cases. And yet um, there is, you know, once, once the kids did return to school, we did not see the numbers go up. So that's something that is um, raising everybody's eyebrows right now and, and we're very curious about it and we're looking into understanding why. So typical CHIPS case, remember kids that just come in uh, uh, that uh, where the kids may still go back home and parents are still involved. Um, you know, what we do, we have client visits at least once a month where we talk to them, we text with them, we do Zoom calls, and we're always going to the comfort level of the child. So I don't tell the kid that I only do Zooms. I ask the child, how do you like to talk? How would you like to talk? Would you like me to call you once a month? Did you want to just text me? What works for you? Uh, we prepare for court hearings. We review the reports that are coming in, but we're not required to submit any reports. Again, because remember, we're attorney-client privileged. We're not required to say anything. Um, and the review hearings are every 90 days, which looks at the placement and well-being of the child and updates on parents' progress on their case plan, as well as that concurrent planning that I mentioned earlier, where we're, we're preparing ourselves for the instance that uh, a reunification may not work so that we we have everything uh, planned um, if it comes to that. We follow up with the child after the court hearings. And we also help um, in a very child-friendly way explain to the child, what does the decision mean? What are some of the terms that were said in the courtroom? Uh, you know, what is this CHIPS adjudication? You know, what, what does all that mean? So we kind of um, Fisher price it, if you will, for lack of a better word, for the child so that they can understand. Because we do talk to 10 year olds, nine year olds, children that are so overwhelmed that they just need somebody to explain that to them. And then some cases that go to trial will step in, obviously. Um, typical state words case. So those that was the chips. The state words is also client visits, contact review hearings are also every 90 days. And they look at placement uh, and progress towards adoption. We no longer have progress towards parents' case plan because the parents are now gone. In Minnesota, by statute, a child at the age of 14 or older must consent to an adoption. And so this is where we come in as their attorneys to help them understand what does that mean? What does that consent look like? And also make sure that if adopted, um, and separated from their biological siblings that we actually draft and execute a sibling contract contact agreement so that post-adoption, uh, the adoptive parents can play a role for the biological siblings to stay in contact. Because oftentimes, not oftentimes, but there are many cases where children are separated for the purposes of adoption. We've had cases where we got 17 children coming in from one family. And obviously it is pretty much impossible to find a foster adoptive home for that many children. So they were separated, but we played a significant role in make sure that those siblings um, stay in touch. And that case was a long time ago where all 17 of them are now adults and they all are in touch. They haven't lost uh, touch with each other, and that actually is, um, I guess, a, a good outcome, relatively good, because everything is relatively good in child protection matters. Um, for extended foster care youth, those are children who are 18 through 21 who can be eligible to stay in care after the age of 18 if they meet certain criteria, uh, then we have review hearings once a year for those as well. 
And every now and then, if we don't like that it's a year from now, we will ask the court that we need three months from now or six months from now, depending on what's going on. And judges are pretty flexible about that. So the statute requires that it's at least once a year, but um, we oftentimes advocate for it being a little bit more often because so much changes in the youth's life in a year. Um, Rich, how am I doing on time? I can't hear you. You're on mute. Sure. So, you know, it would be, I don't know how long you have left, but you left at least 20 minutes or so. Or maybe okay. a little more for a Just really quickly, I want to give you a couple of examples. And, and please forgive me if you are familiar with this. I don't know who's in the audience or what your experience is, but just kind of sharing with you some of our uh, client cases that we've had. So we have Kyla. 16 years old, a high school junior, sexually abused by her mother's boyfriend. Mother doesn't believe her. Not uncommon, by the way, because that boyfriend is probably the one that paying, pays the bills and mom's, mom needs him desperately. Um, and she was physically and emotionally abused by her mother. Mother and her boyfriend are undocumented in the United States. Biological father currently in prison for theft in another country. Kyla has never met him and she lost contact with her siblings. So again, not a typical case. Um, we have James, 16 years old, high school sophomore, in foster care since he was nine, witnessed significant domestic violence and a victim of physical abuse. Both parents are chemically dependent and unable to care for their children. James uh, disrupts many placements, and that's not uncommon for our clients as well. For whatever reason, it just doesn't work. They disrupt their placements, and they have difficulty trusting people. For those of you who are familiar with RAD, uh, reactive attachment disorder, it is, um, it's a tough one to have, but that is what causes a child to uh, not trust. And so they tend to disrupt placements because the effect that RAD has on them is that, you know, they just don't trust any good relationships because in the past, the good relationships and connections with adults haven't worked. So if something is working too good, they are just saying, like, I'm, I'm not getting this. I'm not letting this get too close to me because I know how it ends. And yeah, James is on run. He's homeless. And sometimes there's not much we can do about it. Um, and there have been instances where <laughs> the, the judge... I had a case where a judge ordered uh, law enforcement to look for the client who was on run. So there was a warrant out there and all of this. And I knew where the client was and I've been talking to the client. And the judge kind of sort of only asked me if I knew where the client was. And because of the attorney-client privilege, the judge knew not to ask any more information. I could not disclose where my child client, child, uh, child client was. Uh, but at the end, um, you know, after some discussion with this client that I had who was on run, uh, we did help orchestrate, for the lack of a better word, but facilitate, I guess, um, the child coming back into the system and sort of waiving that uh, warrant um, when the child was ready. April 13, eighth grade, now both parents are chemically dependent. Father was physically abusing her. She struggled in school and was failing most classes, placed in foster care with her brother, but they were placed with a relative who made sure that April knew how inconvenient it was for them uh, and, uh, uh, to have them and used April as their babysitter for their biological children. Not uncommon as well, right? I have this foster kid who can just now watch my kids. Um, and they wanted to adopt the brother, but not the sister because the sister was a teenager and the boy was you know, a little younger and they could handle him. Uh, this was actually a case I handled myself directly, um, and the guardian ad litem in this case was okay with that plan. My client did not like the guardian ad litem. We did not agree because the law in Minnesota actually says that to the extent possible, and unless it is impossible, and I'm paraphrasing, children should be kept together for the purposes of adoption. You can only separate them if it's impossible to keep them together. And in this case, there was no reason to separate them. So we filed uh, a request from the county to look into other relatives. They ended up finding somebody in Wisconsin who adopted both children. Um, April is now, oh gosh, graduating from college. She graduated from high school. She graduated from college. They are in an amazing family who took them to a relative wedding in 
Mexico and then took them to Disneyland and they're doing great. But again, this is a case where imagine this situation without April's lawyer. They would have ended up being um, separated for the purposes of adoption and then it would have been devastating for April. Oh, uh, this case was also interesting. The county filed for termination of parental rights. And in preparation for the trial of parents' uh, termination of parental rights, um, obviously there was some work preparing April for it because it's emotional. April decided that she wanted to testify at that trial and she wanted to testify against the parents and she wanted to go to court and tell the parents everything that she has kind of bottled up um, uh, to tell them and just agree with the termination of parental rights and kind of speak on behalf of her younger brother who couldn't have a voice. He was younger than 10, so we didn't represent him. He wasn't eligible for an attorney. We're in the courtroom. It's, I don't know, Tuesday morning, 8 a.m. We're waiting, waiting, waiting. And the judge brings us, brings me in. I left April in the hallway to tell me that the parents were no show. Um, I, I, I talk about trauma. A child who is prepared to testify against their parents at the termination of parental rights trial who didn't even bother showing up at the trial, um, didn't want to fight. They chose they chose their um, drugs over their children. So obviously that case was, their parents' rights were terminated by default because a no-show was a default, but it was devastating. Um, April was so ready. And so it was nerve wracking for her, obviously. I think she was 15 or 16 at the time. Oh, and by the way, just so you know, names are changed, genders are changed. These are not actual, actual cases uh, because we can't disclose. So her name's not April, but I just want to kind of um, uh, share with you some of the cases that we have because the scenarios are pretty much close to what we have. David's 11 in sixth grade, uh, and he came into the system as an infant. So we got him once he turned 10, but up until then, he didn't have a lawyer. Lived with many relatives. Uh, there was a family that returned him back home, and they actually fabricated a divorce. They said, oh, we no longer can take care of him because we're going through a divorce, and they weren't. Um, and so the kid kind of came back in the system, which is awful to once again realize that somebody doesn't want you. Um, it was very traumatizing. There was some serious mental health going on with the parents. Um, yeah, several adoptions fell through. He's eager to make friends, but struggles to make meaningful connections, and you can kind of see why. So, so those are kind of some of the actual examples, but other vulnerable youth that is not necessarily known to the system are kids that I mentioned earlier in the presentation as those kids who are couch hopping on the run, homeless, the system may not even know <coughs> of them, or home isn't an option for a variety of reasons. Again, <clears throat> there's abuse of home, or this is, we're dealing with LGBTQ, youth who are not accepted at home um, or um, at times kicked out by the parents. Um, and of course, sexually exploited uh, children and youth. So um, this is an interesting one. Is anybody typical? No, 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 no case that we deal with is, is typical. No kid is typical. Uh, most are in a fight or flight mode because all they know is survival. <clears throat> and all, all they know is today, not tomorrow. They're scared, confused, angry. They're angry sometimes at the system for removing them. They're angry at their parents. And the scariest of all is when the child feels <clears throat> tremendous guilt for speaking up, which resulted in removal or criminal investigation of the parents. And they believe that it's because they spoke up. And so they feel have this guilt and remorse and they believe that they caused all this chaos and they internalize it and they carry this guilt with them. Um, you know, kids that we have don't necessarily trust us right away because they have had bad experience developing trusting relationships because those that are supposed to love them most are the ones that failed them. Uh, and I'm talking about their, their biological parents um, significantly traumatized. Uh, yeah, most want to go home. And, and all they're saying, sometimes they're saying like, I just want mom to get better. I want mom to stop drinking or using drugs. I want to go home. And, um, you know, that biological bond that children have with their parents, you know, you can legally terminate it, but you can't 
biologically terminated. They still have it. <clears throat> they don't trust the system. Once in the system, they meet a lot of people. And they can meet anywhere from 10 to 20 people in the day, especially early stages of investigation. You know, the cops, the social worker, those that interview them, everybody else, a lot of people. And for them to understand our role right away takes, you know, it's impossible. It takes them a while to, because at first we're just another adult in the system. And then they kind of understand that, ah, this is the person that works for me for free and I can fire them if I want to. And it is, it's interesting to be fired by a child client. We have, we have been fired. Our volunteer attorneys have been fired. Um, but again, that's their decision and that's how they are empowered um, on, on their cases. I have this here because I'll be remiss if I didn't. How can you help? Obviously, to the extent possible, please support CLC financially. We are a nonprofit organization that relies on donations and contributions and grants. Um, if you are participating in the United Way campaigns, we're not listed as an organization, but if you write us in, we will receive the contribution. Check with your employers about the match. Many employers match their contribution, their employees' contributions. Uh, if you know of an attorney, let them know of our organization. We're always looking for volunteer attorneys. And of course, we frequently do um, drives for gift cards or essentials for kids who are first coming into the system, oftentimes, unfortunately, with their stuff in garbage bags. And so we try to collect new duffel bags that they have and some of the very, very immediate essentials, toothbrush, toothpaste, socks, you know especially for older boys, for some reason, it's a problem. You know, blankets, shampoo, conditioner, deodorant, you know, all the things that you would think, journal maybe, um, you know, anything like that that um, is helpful. Questions? So, um, I, I think you're, you're ready for some uh, questions or comments from people. Um, we're not very formal here. It's not a uh, large crowd, so you can just speak up or you can put something in the chat box or whatever you prefer uh, would be good. Um, and, um, you know, I, I'll just start you out with one. Um, there was a tuition law which covered all of the costs of uh, college in Minnesota, these public institutions for fosters who graduate, who got out of high school. So have you seen any impact from that? Because previously, you know, only a small percentage of, of children aging out of foster care actually went on to yep. higher education. Yep. And again, this is, so we have to answer your question. Yes, we have. And this is where um, we serve as a resource for children, but also for our volunteer attorneys to help them understand what the additional benefits are so that they can have that conversation with their child client uh, and also bring it up um, with the county to make sure that they address this need. So it's very important um, for children and youth, well, their youth, 18 through 21 is when that is more applicable to stay in care past the age of 18 is an option, but there is an eligibility uh, requirement and the eligibility is the youth must work at least 20 hours a week or be in school or on the path to be enrolled or demonstrate that they have enough obstacles that uh, prevents them from attending school or uh, being employed. And so once they meet that eligibility, is that, that they will then be eligible for the extended foster care benefits up to the age of 21. So I see some questions in the chat. I can just kind of go over them, uh, Rich, if, if you're okay with that, or else you want to read them out all. So um, do you provide any mental health services for children? So short answer is no. We are lawyers, we're not healthcare providers. Um, we don't provide any medical uh, services. However, uh, we advocate for them. So that is our job is to identify any needs that a child may have and um, either ask for a referral or a reassessment or a medical reevaluation um, because we have some cases where a child has 
21 pages of diagnosis and, you know, 13 and a half pages of medications that they're on. And so we oftentimes will just ask that that is being reevaluated, especially if the initial assessment was done a while ago. <clears throat> so no, we're not really a medical services organization. Um, here's a question from a garden at Lightham. Um, and so the garden at Lightham thought that your distinction, our distinction between the garden role and your role was well expressed. Oh, thank you. That is a comment, not a question. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I'm trying to, is it Carmen? It has to be Carmen. Um, you know, I, I, it's interesting because so many times we find ourselves having to explain the difference. Um, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for people to ask us, well, what's the difference if the child has a guardian litem that's looking out for the child's best interest, what, what do you do? And what is the difference? And why is the learner necessary? So thank you for that. Yes, um, we are expressed wishes, which may or may not be in the child's best interest. I do have a question. Um, I'm a retired child protection worker, supervisor, worked in the system for 40 years, um, retired in 2014. And when you were talking about the statutory definitions of physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, and so forth, if I understood you correctly, you were saying that for sexual abuse, if the sexual offender was a biological parent, that that would then result in basically an automatic termination of parental rights. If that's the case, maybe I misunderstood it, but that certainly is not the case up through 2014. So I'm just gonna clarify this a little bit. It, it's not necessarily that it's a biological parent, um, but they're custodial parent. Okay. Uh, but it may also be biological um, that is obviously in the physical presence of the child. So yes, it is pretty much an automatic termination of parental rights, but not without a trial first. There will be a trial. When, when did that law change? Because as of 2014 anyway, there's a provision where the county could file what was called an expedited TPR, but that That's was just a petition and there's no presumptive outcome to that petition. And many times those petitions were not acted upon until the criminal process was completed. And during that time, the county was still obligated to provide a case plan. So what you're talking about sounds very, very different than what was going on up until 2014. And I'm sorry, I can't see your name, um, but um, you and I are actually talking about the same thing. So there will not be a requirement of a one year in order for the county to file a termination of parental rights. It will go straight to the expedited termination of parental rights. And again, not without a trial. There will be no case plan. I don't know when that changed, but it was, it was in place in 2014 for sure. So not in, in practice, it wasn't. <laughs> now, maybe there's a distinction between different counties, but at least in Hennepin County, we would only be relieved of the obligation to provide a case plan if there was a petition attached to the or a deposition. I can't remember all the legal terms, uh, but we would have to petition the court to be asked to be relieved of our obligation to provide a case plan. If not, we're statutorily obligated to provide a case plan. So procedurally, if a petition for a termination of parental rights is filed and it's set for trial, there will be no court hearings in our case plan in between. So I maybe we can take this offline, but... Um, yeah, I, I don't want to bog down the rest of the conversation on that technicality, but... Yeah. It, it just sounds like either the law changed or Hennepin County practice was different than other counties, which I happened sometimes, but Hennepin was kind of the majority gold standard for the state of Minnesota in a lot of ways. So anyway, I'll, I'll shut up. Thank you. Maybe we can clarify it through Rich um, after this. Um, but um, here is another one. I'm a Gail working with. Uh, well, uh, Kathleen, yeah. I think was, uh, he's been waiting for. And then, yeah, I, I'd just like to say something. Um, often the foster parents are the voice of the child. 
And um, we are a player in the system. And um, over the many years, I've had to advocate in so many ways and, and um, you know, go before the judge and, and speak for the child. And so I, I just would like to kind of um, put more emphasis on the voice of the foster parent because we are shut down many times. Mm -hmm. And um, were there wonderful foster parents and there are foster parents that definitely should not have a voice, but um, yeah, we are, we, we are the voice of the child many times. And, and I just uh, wish we would uh, be able to express that more. I know, Kathy, so what you're saying, what you are referring to is um, the fact that you are not a party. You're not even at the table. You can be in the courtroom, but you're not oh, at the table. many times. Right. I, um, so this is where a good garden at Lightham will actually be very important because a good garden at Lightham will talk to the foster parents as well. Um, and we'll talk to the child and we'll talk to uh, the parents and everybody else. And then they will kind of make an assessment on the whole picture and should bring it forward if it's something that is meaningful and is a voice of the child that is something the judge should hear. Um, in instances where the child's expressed wishes is not the same as the child's best interest, mm -hmm. This is where it is critical that we have a good guardian ad litem on the case, because if we don't, and we tell the judge, this is what the child wants, and this is what you should order, because that is our role. If we don't have a guardian ad litem to balance it and say, whoa, 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 whoa but that's not in, in the child's best interest, uh, it gets a little tricky and complicated. And that's why we believe that having a very good, well-trained, experienced, diligent guardian ad litem is so important in all of the cases and, and particularly when you have a lawyer that comes in and hey I'm just the voice of a child I, I don't filter it through the best interest um, uh, lens if you will um, but yeah and, foster you know, parents. Yeah thank you for bringing that up and you know we always you know want to uh, have that issue in terms of foster parents role and Lily, there's a couple more. I just want to try to make sure that you know you get to. Um, and Kathleen Gelino is, is there, and then there's one after that. So um, Carol wanted to know how the children are referred to us. We are court appointed. So we have an agreement with Ramsey County that every child who comes into the system that is 10 or older is appointed to Children's Law Center of Minnesota. Um, and then we also have a contract with Hennepin County by which we are appointed to every state ward that is 10 or older. So if a child comes in and is 10 or older, we get appointed, or if the child's already in the system and turns 10 while in the system, then we get them as well. So we're court appointed. Am I missing any other questions? Oh, here's yes, one. There's one there about uh, from Kathleen. Um, I'm a guardian ad litem working on a sibling group, and when I came, when it came time for one of them to be assigned an attorney when they turned 10, CLC could not represent them due to a conflict. Can you talk about what conflicts would prevent siblings from all having the same attorney? Very, very good question. Um, that is our dilemma in that uh, if we have a conflict of interest within the siblings, we cannot represent both sides, if you will. Um, and we determine what constitutes a conflict of interest because we are bound by the rule of ethics, by the lawyer's rule of ethics. We cannot represent uh, children who are in conflict with each other. Now, what is and isn't a conflict? I'll give you a couple of examples. If we have a group of sibling, and one of the kids says, I wanna go back home, and the other one says, no way, that's not a conflict of interest. But if one of the children is sexually inappropriate with the other one, um, we cannot represent both because one's a perpetrator, the other one is a victim. That's a conflict of interest. And I'm just giving this to you as an example. We cannot possibly take this case because we will lose our license. It is legal malpractice for us. And so, yes, um, we, we decline those appointments and we are just, we're bound by lawyers' rules of ethics. One thing before we sign off is it didn't really take credit for the fact that a lot of children who are 10 and over have a lawyer because of uh, Children's Law Center. Uh, getting uh, McKenna's Law passed several years ago um, 
uh, Aaron Holtz was uh, a child who, um, who successfully got legislation passed with the Children's Law Center's help to say that not only are children 10 and over entitled to a lawyer, but they have to be told, they have to be informed affirmatively about that right. And I'm wondering, first of all, you should take credit for that. And secondly, um, have you seen an uptick in the number of children who are actually at legal representation as a result? Well, it was an interesting law, Rich, because while on the policy level, it was an amazing law to pass because we all agree uh, there was the right thing to do. Um, it actually ended up being an unfunded mandate as many of our laws are in the state of Minnesota. And so while every child now is informed of their right to an attorney and if they ask for one, they shall get one. Uh, and the law also provides that if a child waives that right to an attorney, they still have to speak with the lawyer first who can explain to them what is it that they are waiving and then have that conversation with, um, with the judge, with, with the judge will then accept the waiver. So um, we did see an uptick in 2018 and 19, our cases went up. And then of course we talked about the fact that they're going down. Um, and I don't know what the public defenders are doing in counties where we are not, right? Because where Children's Law Center doesn't represent these kids, it is the job of the public defenders to do this. And as we all know, public defenders are overwhelmed, underfunded, uh, overworked, um, not a perfect system. And we occasionally get phone calls from public defenders. I don't know, Bumiji recently who said, I just got appointed to this case. What do I do? Where do I begin? And so we consult with public defenders where we can, but um, from what I'm hearing from public defenders that call us is that there is no training uh, that they get on child protection. Public defenders, there's no training at all. So when they get a case, and as you can imagine in rural counties, they're a little you know, far in between, a little bit more, you know, not as frequent. Um, they're not well equipped to handle these cases, unfortunately. So yay to McKenna law, but mm, you know, not as much resources still. Well, I guess that's our next assignment. Um, well, before we sign off, I want to again mention uh, two weeks from now, we're going to have a presentation by Maya Schulte. If you can wait to everybody, that's Maya. Come and see her. And she's going to talk about, she's a brand new uh, lawyer in Minnesota, and she's going to talk about uh, her work in analyzing all the child fatalities in the last a number of years. So that should be interesting. We're getting uh, some early results, and actually, Ray Gardner is working on that project with her, uh, putting in a lot of effort, and she's even assigned me a little work. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. But um, so I think that, uh, that's the time that we have. We want to respect your time, everybody. But I just want to say again, Lily, thank you. You've been uh, just a great advocate for children for years. Um, you're one of the, I, I don't contribute to many nonprofits, but I certainly contribute to Children's Law Center because you play such an important role in our community. And, you know, I you know, urge others to take a look as well. So. Thank you so much uh, for your work. And please, if, you, if it's okay, send us your PowerPoint because we'll put that on the website with, your, with the um, video recording. Absolutely. And Rich, I don't know if you saw that, but um, we're going to have an in-person event this year, our fundraising event and benefit, um, because due to the pandemic, we had to have them virtually. But this year is going to be on October 13th at the Nicollet Pavilion. We're very excited. Good, good. All right. Well, um, so with that, um, uh, thank you again so much. And thank you, everybody, for showing up. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.